Welcome to the lecture over cell transport. In order for us to talk about cell transport, we first have to talk about the cell membrane. The cell membrane is the outer layer of your cells that prevents things from coming in and out of your cells. So the function of the cell membrane separates the stuff on the inside of the cell from the stuff from the outside. So it is that barrier. It also is known as what we call the bouncer of the cell or it regulates the flow of nutrients, the flow of water, oxygen, and even carbon dioxide into and out of the cell. So it tells the cell whether to bring certain nutrients in or to let certain nutrients out. It helps maintain homeostasis or balance by moving those molecules in and out of the cell. And it's also known as what we call semi-permeable, which means it allows only some things to cross the membrane but doesn't allow other things to. Now what does it look like? The cell membrane is made up of lipids. Remember we talked about lipids in our last unit? Lipids are fats, and so your cell membrane is made up of fats, and this is what it looks like here. This is the phospholipid membrane, which means that it has two layers of membranes with their heads on one side and their tails on the inside. So over here we have the hydrophilic head which is water loving. And so this is going to be on both the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. So if this was the out, it'd be facing the water on the outside of the cell. And this is the inside of the cell, it'd be facing the water on the inside. While this one is hydrophobic or water fearing, also known as nonpolar. And so here, these tails don't like to interact with water. And so they like to arrange in such a way where these water-loving molecules are on the outside and the water-fearing molecules are on the inside so that they don't have to interact with water. A couple of terms you're going to need to know is hydro is another term for water. Philic means loving. Phobic means fearing. If you think of phobia, you fear something. Polar means that it's water loving or it can dissolve in water. And nonpolar means that it's water fearing but also does not dissolve in water. So, why is the cell membrane important? I want you to write in your notes where it says why you think this cell membrane is important. Looking back at those functions, why do you think it's important? Now before we can talk about how the membrane regulates what enters and leaves, we'll have to look at some terms. What's going to enter and what's going to leave? First, solute. That means it's a substance that dissolves into a solution. And so that could be something like salt, sugar. When you dissolve it into water, it is this solute. The solvent is the liquid that dissolves the solute. And so the water would be the solvent, while the salt would be the solute. Then you have the solution, which is the solute and the solvent together. Another example could be the solute would be Kool-Aid powder, while the solvent is water. And then the solution would be the Kool-Aid that you create. Next are conditions, and these are conditions when compared to other conditions. So first we have hyper which means that there's more solute in that area compared to the other side of the membrane. So if we said the inside is hypertonic, that means that there's more solute inside of the cell than outside of the cell. Now the opposite of that is hypo, which means it has less solute compared to the other side of the membrane. And so if the inside of the cell is hypertonic, then the outside of the cell would be hypotonic. Now, if both of those are equal, we would call them iso, or equal solutes on both sides of the membrane. So let's look at that again. Hypotonic means there's a low concentration of solutes compared to the other side of the membrane. So here we have a low concentration of the salt on this side. There's only one, while this one there's a lot. So this solution out here we would call hypotonic. Next we have isotonic, that means the conditions are the same on the inside and the out. So the solute concentration is the same here as it is here, it is equal. While here in hypertonic, it means there's a high concentration of solutes 
compared to the other side of the membrane. So this would be considered hypertonic compared to this solution. Now they're always in comparison to one another. So this one would be called hypertonic, while inside the cell here we'd call hypotonic. There are different types of cell transport, and when we talk about cell transport, it's when the cell is placed in a specific environment, it's going to respond to maintain homeostasis. homeostasis. It does it by moving solute, nutrient, salt, or even water across the membrane. And so here, you have a lot of dots over here and a small amount of dots over here, and so naturally the cell is going to want to move some of those solutes to make it equal. And that would be called, and it does this by concentration gradient. And that is how molecules are spread in a particular area. It can have a high concentration, a low concentration, or even an even concentration. So here's an example of a high concentration area versus a low, and then this is an even concentration. So if we look here, this would be considered a high concentration, while this would be considered a low concentration. There are two types of transport, passive transport and active transport. And we're going to talk about passive transport today. Passive transport does not require energy for the cell to move the molecules. And it moves the molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. While active transport does require energy, and it moves molecules from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration and it needs an energy source, so it needs some ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate. So we're going to talk about passive today, the ones that do not require energy, and we're going to talk about active next week. The first example of passive transport is diffusion, and this is the movement of small uncharged molecules, like salt, across the cell membrane directly and it moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration because it's trying to maintain homeostasis. So here we have a high concentration of salt. They're going to move directly across the membrane because they're small enough to this area of low concentration to try to create a balance. An example would be if a cell was placed in a hypotonic solution, like less salt outside of the cell than inside, salt would then move from the inside of the cell towards the outside of the cell until it reaches homeostasis. So here, this would be a cell placed in a hypotonic solution. So there's less salt outside of this cell as the amount of salt inside of the cell. And so it's going to move this salt outside of the cell and to reach homeostasis. Next, we have facilitated diffusion. This is the movement of larger molecules, like glucose, across the cell membrane, still from a high concentration to a low concentration. Since these ones are larger, they have to pass through a protein channel rather than through the membrane. So since these guys are way too big, they're not going to be able to go straight through this membrane. They're going to have to find a protein channel that will allow them to pass through, kind of like a tunnel. So an example here is if a cell was placed in a hypertonic solution, so there's more glucose on the outside of the cell than the amount of glucose on the inside of the cell, the glucose will move this direction towards the inside of the cell in order to maintain homeostasis or balance. Finally, we have osmosis, and osmosis is particularly the movement of water across the cell membrane from high concentration to low concentration. If you notice, all three of these move from high to low concentration because passive transport moves from high concentration to low concentration. This specifically is talking about water, though. So we're not talking about these solute molecules anymore. We're talking about the solvent, or the water molecules. So here's an example. If a cell was placed in a hypotonic solution, where there's more water inside of the cell, than outside of the cell, and so here let's say there's more water here on the inside than outside of the cell, the water is going to move towards the outside of the cell until it reaches homeostasis. So looking at this picture, thinking of osmosis and the movement of water, why do you think there's a difference in osmosis between animal cells up here and plant cells down here? What's happening? What is 
different. So if you see here, the plant cells do not burst if they fill up or shrink with water because they have a cell wall that keeps them structurally stable. While animal cells, if we get too much water, will end up bursting, and if we don't have enough, will shrivel up and they won't become functional after that. Here we have a couple of examples. You're first going to want to fill in the other percentage for each of these. So we have 10% solute here, which means we have 90% water, and 20% solute here, which means we have 80% water. Now which way is water going to move? Because there is more water here, it's going to move to where there's not as much water. So 80 or 90% water, 80% water, the water is going to move outside of the cell. Here, we have 60% water to 40% solute, 70% water to 30% solute. So the water is going to move inside the cell because there's more water out here than inside. Next, 75% water to 25% solute, 80% water to 20% solute. There's more water on the outside and so water is going to move in. I'm going to have you practice these three with these individual dots representing water and see if you can figure those out. 